Welcome everyone. Uh, it is January 31st, 2023, and we're here with the Evans Clark County Commission, myself, Mayor Kelly Gertz, uh, for a work session at which we've got a, a single item, but an item that has several components uh, that we need to discuss. And so we're going to be gathering with Caitlin Dye, our business development and incentive coordinator, to talk about uh, the first uh, use of our tax allocation district program, uh, which was uh, an application by the Levin Group regarding the former mall property on Atlanta Highway. And so uh, Caitlin is going to carry us through this. And I know there'll be uh, questions. And so uh, if we would just sort of stop maybe at the end of every component uh, and uh, have some time for questions at that point. So Caitlin, thank you so much for being with us. And I know uh, Ilka McConnell, our economic development director, is here with us as well. Yes, well, thank you, Mayor Gertz, for introducing the topic for us. So um, good evening, Mayor and Commission. Um, uh, for those that weren't here at the, the last work session I was at, my name is Caitlin Dunn. I do work for the Economic Development Department here at athens Clark County. Uh, this evening we're going to go in more detail of the application we received from the Levin Group for TAD financing. Uh, so our agenda for tonight is listed, so we'll start with an overview of the staff report that Ms. Jean sent out to you all. Uh, we'll go then into an explanation of the community benefits agreement. Dan McCray, our TAD attorney, will give that uh, overview. I'll briefly go over the timeline and our next steps from here. And our last presentation will be from the developer themselves. Uh, as Mayor Gert said, please feel free to have questions throughout tonight, but we will have um, time reserved at the end to answer any other lingering questions that you may have not have been able to get in when that topic came across the board. So to start with, uh, the overview of the staff report. So how we, um, Ilka and myself, evaluated the application that we received are from the criteria that is listed. So I'll go into each of these and give like a, a, a main highlight. So the first one, the amount and financing option that is requested. So their request is for 29% of the total horizontal cost plus the value of the project vertical improvements distributed on a PAYGO basis for 30 years. So this is a percent that can change. Uh, it, it could change due to fluctuating project costs, construction costs, labor costs. Um, so they did place a monetary value just for helpful sakes to judge the amount that is being requested, but that is not the actual request. It is an actual percent. Um, our policy reads that our max percent is 15%, which is standard for gap financing, which is normally not a third of the total capital stack that is presented in a project. However, our policy does allow, um, uh, has a clause that allows for more than 15% to be allocated in a request and that is justifiable for a large redevelopment project. However, that must be covered in enough TAD increment generated by the project. So if, we're, if they're asking for more than 15%, the TAD increment that's generated by the project must be enough to cover whatever that request is. So the next uh, bullet point that I'll speak to um, is just a high level of the eligibility of the TAD funds requested per, per the Georgia Redevelopment Powers Law. At this time, we don't have enough information to, or I should say our TAD attorney does not have enough information to, to specifically say which TAD funds are eligible per the redevelopment powers law, but I will let um, our TAD attorney speak on that specifically when he gets to the explanation of the community benefits agreement. He'll address how he um, will address this component later on when we get to that. So I'll, I'll reserve that 
for him to explain in further detail. Uh, the developer's qualifications and experience. <clears throat> so staff has been unable to identify other similar projects completed by this team specifically. So a combination of the Levin Group, Athens Construction Group, and WNA Engineering together as a means to determine appropriate experience with these types of large scale mixed use projects. The next point is our school impact and student population. So this um, data was from a school impact analysis and financial analysis that we received on the original application. While the original application um, has now been updated it does not change the school impact analysis because it's based off of the number of units that are being built within the development and then how many jobs will be created out of that development. So the updated application doesn't change those numbers. So currently that analysis says that the uh, development will generate 221 new students to this development so they could go to either of the schools that are represented in this district so there are three and they are uh, Cleveland Road Elementary, Bernie Harris Lyons Middle School and Clark Central High School. Um, so to help the school board um, with a monetary value because they asked us to provide a monetary impact. I took the per pupil expenditure for each of those schools and took the ratio of current students within those schools within the development and divided that across the students that are being generated and multiplied that out by the per pupil expenditure. And you'll see that data chart in your staff report. So you'll see on a monetary expenditure wise how much the students would um, be impacted wise per pupil per year. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the next bullet is the housing creation. So they're currently proposing that 1,188 residential units will be built. So of that, 202 units are townhomes, 816 units are market rate multifamily, and 170 units are market rate active adult units. So if you take that um, and look at the affordability component that they're requesting, their um, request doing 10% affordable units at 80% AMI. So that comes out to be 99 total units of um, at 80% AMI, which is also 140 bedrooms. Um, so your staff report breaks that down as to far as how many studios would be at that affordable rate, how many one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedrooms. And those will also take into account um, the senior living as well. So there will be senior affordable housing a part of this project. So uh, the next bullet point is project job creation and wages. So the number of estimated full-time jobs to be created by this development is 1,300 or 1,035. I'm sorry. Um, however, our um, third-party financial analysis estimated that there would be 350. So there was some discrepancy in the amount of jobs that would be created by this development. The the type of jobs to be created are more um, in line with retail and restaurant sectors, which may not pay above average wages and are typically part-time, non-benefited. So just to give some uh, data for regional athens clark County numbers, retail average wage in athens clark County is $35,592. And 11.8% of our population is currently employed in the retail sector. 
Uh, for food and beverage, the average wage is $21,289, and 11% is um, currently employed by food and beverage. So my last bullet point goes over just other high-level community revitalization, revitalization impacts. So the development will also be producing a transit facility. This will be uh, built and ran by ACC Transit. So this will allow residents of the development to have easy access to affordable transportation and hopefully reduce vehicles on site and around um, the development as well. There will also be a 12 foot wide multi-use trail that will be constructed around the development um, which is part of 7,818 linear feet of paths with, with, um, within the development as well. It will also reduce the impervious surface of the development by 20 acres. So as you all know it now, it's, it's pretty much asphalt and concrete. So it will be good to, to have more um, green space introduced into the area. And then lastly, it'll uh, revitalize a less than full tenancy mall that currently only has one acre, one anchor tenant, which is Belk, of course, by creating 352,000 square feet of commercial space, of which will be 70,000 office space, um, which is, is much needed in athens Clark County. So that's just a high level overview of the staff report. Before I turn it over to Dan, does anybody have any questions after reviewing the staff report? Yes, ma'am. Uh, um, when you mentioned about the job creation, and um, it does seem to be a big gap, and you talked about primarily restaurant and retail as the um, employers. Um, did we take into account a possible uh, increase in teachers and school district administration because all of those schools will probably have to bring in more to accommodate um, the increase in student population. So is that number calculated or thought about in, this, um, in these numbers? I don't know that to be fully honest. Our um, third party economist did that, so I'll be more than happy to go back and ask him that question and relay that answer to you once I have that answer from him. Thank you. Yeah. Let me write that down for Carol. Yeah, um, there was a, a point you made earlier about the um, TED increments must uh, cut, be able to cover the whole cost of this. Was it the TED increments from the mall full footprint or for the full foot, uh, footprint of the TED area? So it would be however the application um, is compiled. So this application is compiled on a, a parcel basis, so it's not taken in the increment from the full entire district. So those parcels would have to generate enough increment to cover whatever uh, is being asked. So, so the money covered in the TAD is coming from the development itself, and if something's adjacent but in the TED area, that money would go not be going to this developer in that is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And I don't I don't think we did get a copy of this uh, PowerPoint. Not the PowerPoint because I just finished that today. So I'll okay. get the PowerPoint out okay. to y'all tomorrow. But hopefully y'all have gotten all the other bless, I think it was like nine or ten documents I sent. <laughs> <laughs> well we got one document that's like I think it may be, pages long. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she just combined them all for you okay. so that way <laughs> you didn't have to flip through 10 different documents. Yes. Um, talking about the wages for food and beverage, that doesn't take into consideration, that's just their base, their hourly rate. That doesn't take into consider tips, correct? I don't believe that our... So it would be anything that they report to the IRS. So th I pulled that number off of um, our website that I'll be happy to forward you as yeah. well. So I'd, it would be whatever they report to them. 
one more question mm -hmm. on the, the independent um, economic analysis. Are, are we getting a copy of that? So y'all received that one. It's the analysis that was completed on the original application. Um, what was the name of that group? The what's Robert's group's name? The economic group. Yeah, I think the the company's name I'm blanking at the moment is is called the Economic Impact Group. Um, so that was part of what was sent over to you, but it, it was based on the original application. So we do hope to have an updated analysis that addresses the updated application. We're still waiting on that one to be completed. So as soon as I have the updated analysis, I'll be more than happy to, to send that over to you as well. So that's the 10 page attachment number seven. That yeah, it's in the pack, it's in the packet. That we receive. It's this one here. What's the email? Oh, it's oh, it's in that long document. Yeah. yeah. This is the opening page. Any others before we move on to the next piece? All right. Thanks for that, kid. You are more than welcome. All right. So that gets us to an explanation of the community benefits agreement. So, Dan, can you hear us still by chance? I hear you loud and clear. Good presentation, Caitlin. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. I will leave it over to you to high level explain what the Community Benefits Agreement is and what its task um, is to be. Well, I'm happy to do that. Um, the main purpose of the Community Benefit Agreement is to secure the community benefits as far as the community is concerned. To the developer, it's the mechanism for uh, the developer to receive TAD funds, so there's a each side has an interest in it. Uh, this project um, is a potentially transformational project. It's comparable in a lot of ways to Atlanta's Gulch project. Uh, so, in preparing the community benefits agreement, I've um, imported some of the concepts from the Gulch uh, development agreement, but. It includes our TAD policies, uh, our redevelopment plan, uh, the requirements of our intergovernmental agreement with the Board of Education. It's an Athens document. Um, it most recently, per the request for the developer, contemplates a 30-year term, not to exceed 30 years, which is the maximum. It's PAYGO, as uh, Caitlin said, which means that there won't be any TAD bonds issued, so if there's um, increment there that goes in the special fund that can be paid out, then it'll be paid out to the extent required by the agreement, otherwise not. Um, but nevertheless, it's a, a commitment and it potentially lasts 30 years. So I have uh, made sure to include provisions in here protective of the community that'll be durable for 30 years. One of those provisions is to include what's called a verification agent. There was one of those uh, in the Gulch deal, and uh, as written right now, the document contemplates that would be the investment bank or financial advisor who's working with us now, which is terminus. So some of the things that we know will need to be determined later, and some things that we'd love to determine now that we don't have the data, uh, the payment of any funds will be conditioned on the data arriving and the verification agent confirming it. So that's a check and balance there. Um, the agreement will be effective when the conditions precedent are satisfied. One of those is amending the Board of Education Intergovernmental Agreement uh, as it would be necessary to have this extended term. And there may be some other documents that need amendments as well. So I've allowed right now uh, an outside date of February 14th to do that. That may or may not be long enough, but uh, hopefully it will be. Uh, be aware this is not a short document. Uh, it didn't start out as a short document, and I've been able to include all of the schedules and exhibits so that in the future you don't have to guess what you need to do, you don't have to create a document, they're all there. Um, but it is a, a good night's reading when you get, get around to reading through it. Some of the particular highlights, there are two caps in the document caps on what the development uh, developer can receive. One is a payment limitation that's based on the developer's most recent request, and that's a large one. It's $189,503,000. Uh, 
Um, but that's subject to adjustment based on uh, costs in the application qualifying, and there, there's some that don't. Um, and there is also a reimbursement limitation, which is based on 15% of the project value. As Caitlin noted, that can increase if the project's large enough for the increment to sustain the projected payments. And that's going to be a kind of a running condition that's going to start out at 15% because that's you know, what we got to work with now. And when and if um, the, we can determine that there is enough taxable value, emphasis on the taxable value, not stuff that doesn't go on the tax digest, to sustain a higher percentage, it can go up, but not to exceed 29% because that's what the developer requested. Uh, also, we have benchmarks that have to be met, and basically those represent progress with construction of the phases before uh, a, a requisition will be paid. Um, it states, this community benefits agreement states performance commitments, including the affordability requirement for housing. Our policy is 20% set aside at 80% AMI <coughs> for nine years. Um, and that's what will be in the document uh, when it's distributed initially. And there's a requirement for a land use restriction agreement, as we've used before. Now, we can expect uh, comments from the developer on the document that's distributed. And what the commission will see uh, at the point in time when you have the opportunity to review a document that's uh, stable, as we can get it at that point, and before you vote on it, will reflect these things. And to the extent that uh, there is the desire on the part of the commission to change policy, that will afford the opportunity to do it. And among those conditions uh, is to the effectiveness of the agreement is the ability of the commission to make whatever changes you may want to make. So it's been a, a, a fun, uh, demanding exercise to get to this point, and I'm looking forward to seeing it all the way through and uh, making good things happen in Athens. Those are the highlights. Thank you for that, Dan. I really appreciate it and appreciate all the uh, analysis that you've conducted for this. Uh, I know it's been quite a journey. Uh, any questions for Dan uh, at this moment? Commissioner Thornton. Um, Dan, thank you. Um, you mentioned that there is still some data that you're waiting for. Um, and I think you said you're expecting it around February the 14th. Um, that's lovely. Um, could you give us an example of what data you are waiting for? There is the basic due diligence information that everybody needs, um, but to the extent that we need to establish, you know, for example, what the uh, payment limitation is, that's subject to reduction. If any of the line items uh, don't qualify, as a reimbursable cost under the rebuilt powers law. An example of that, there's a line item for uh, operating deficit subsidy, and that's not eligible. Um, and there are other provisions that need to be addressed. For example, uh, given a large amount that's uh, associated with the housing requirement, and I understand now that a good part of that figure has to do with the increase in cost uh, driven by building to the PD, plan development standard, uh, but nevertheless, to the extent that we're being asked to pay private construction costs, which is legal in Georgia in an uh, appropriate structure, uh, that structure has to be agreed before those costs can be paid. And the uh, document contains a provision for everything being in public ownership with possibly a, a lease or a license or something associated with it. So to the extent that um, there are deal points that are still being discussed or data, that particularly that the verification agent needs to provide a number, um, that data will be required. Some of it is, got, is a got to have before the agreement can be effective, and other is a got to have before a, a uh, requisition can be funded. Okay. Thank you very much. Any My other, pleasure. Other questions for Dan? Uh, Carol? Dan, you're putting you're the person who's drafting the community benefits agreement. Is that correct? Right? That is correct. Okay. That's I'm, correct. I'm looking at um, 
I'm not really sure which part of this document I'm looking at exactly, but it, it lists on page 10 of the document we have goals and priorities for use of TAD funds, and it mentions housing opportunities, economic development, Clark County School District, public in infrastructure. And then there's a, a B that says, in what ways does the project demonstrate a commitment to sustainable design, including water and energy efficiency, recycling and waste reduction, use of green technology? So I was really, really pleased to see that. Um, basically, though, in terms of energy, I see the commitment to will be built to the lead building standards. Um, I would like to also see um, incorporation of uh, the infrastructure needed for electric vehicles. Uh, you know, right now with the Inflation Reduction Act, the kind of incentives that are being offered for individuals to buy used and new uh, electric cars are quite significant. Um, I have not. There's a whole lot of advantage. There's a whole lot of opportunities for homeowners. I'm not sure what's eligible for multifamily in terms of energy efficiency, which would be good for the environment, but also good for the bottom line of the of the, the people who are living there. Um, how is that being addressed? Can we beef that up? Well, I, I can tell you how it could be addressed. In the performance commitments, there is a paragraph for sustainability, which is blank right now, because I, I don't have any input on that. And I, I don't recognize the document that you're reading from. Can, can you or maybe Caitlin tell me what that document is? Can I look at a screen and I can tell uh, you because I didn't see the, the, the it's full. It, the top of the, like, the form this is coming from is the Unified Government of athens Clark County application for TAD financing. My guess is that is Robert Land, the, that third party um, financial consultant that we hired. That's my guess of what document you're looking at well it's uh, it seems to be from the applicant applicant contact is brian lou and mark jennings okay um it's it's on this 69 page document we got this document starts on page six and what i'm referring to is down further this is where they lay out the number of bedrooms and such in this Ath athens clark county thing and down here on page the 10 they go into proposed okay. community benefits um, Nikki helped me. I think it's the actual application that they submitted, I think is what you're looking at. Right, right. Um, actually, that's he, Don, who, who's on the? Dan. Dan. Dan was asking you oh, about which sorry. document. Dan, that was from the actual application. What section? Uh, it's page five of nine of the application. At the bottom of it. All right. Thanks. Let me let me scroll. I have it open. Let me scroll back up. <coughs> while uh, while Dan's looking at that, I, I I can indicate that having spoken with some of our federal partners, mm -hmm. um, private developers do have a tax credit for uh, energy efficiency and. Um, and, and, and non-carbon tax uh, credit mm -hmm. uh, for the next decade mm -hmm. uh, that, that I know a lot of developers are anticipating taking advantage of. And in fact, local governments and nonprofits can take advantage of too. Yeah. I, I would like to know that the developer will be taking advantage of them and also will prepare the, uh, the, the prepare for the electrification of cars and other vehicles that we expect to happen in the next um, 30 years over which this will um, will be paying with this tab. Yes, ma'am. My name is John Williams with w &A Engineering, um, and we, we do fully intend to provide for electric vehicle service in the development and prepare for it in the future as well. So that will be part of that. That will be part of our, our plans, and, and we don't have any problem incorporating that into the community benefits agreement. Okay, that would be great. And any other ideas that Don had that he was referring to? I'm not sure he was he was trying to mention something there at the beginning as well. So, or oh, Dan, sorry. Uh, Caitlin, would you please, after the meeting, email me? I'm not hearing all of that. Just please email me a summary so I can have that in front of me when I make those changes. Yes, sir, I can do that. Thank you. Jesse, question for Dan. 
Yeah, Dan, does the community benefits agreement you're working on have any provisions regarding the labor standards of the actual people doing the construction work? So like the contractors and subcontractors, whether, whether we're talking about them being, you know, minority owned companies or things with regards to the wages that'll be paid to the people actually doing the work. Is there any, is there anything about that included? There is no, there's not at present, no. Okay. Is that something that can be included? Is there another example perhaps in that Atlanta agreement that we could borrow from? Yeah, I, I, I'm able to include that if that's the will of the commission. I, I don't know, uh, of course, the, de the developer gets a, a, a voice as well, but I can certainly include that in the document. Okay. Right, Mr. Fisher. Um, just for FYI, our um, developer is a minority-owned company. Mm -hmm. So so I'm all, um, I, I won't speak for him. My mom was sure he would be using subcontractors um, or people of color and possible women. So I just think we need to keep that out front that that's the case. Mm -hmm. Anyone else before I return to Commissioner Thornton? All right, Commissioner. Um, this would be an opportunity to look into HUD's Section 6 um, program that does give assistance to, um, and it's been around forever, um, but very few developers use it. I don't know why, but it would be an opportunity, Dan, to just look at the section, HUD Section 6 program about uh, minority and underserved um, employees and, and actually targeting them. So Section 6 might be a, might be, um, a source to address, address Commissioner Hull's question. Back to Commissioner Hull. Yeah, the other question I had was, in our MARC meeting yesterday, there was this question raised up about which of the listed elements may potentially be ineligible, you know, questions about eligibility. Mm -hmm. um, did I understand you earlier, did I correctly understand earlier you to be saying that you won't have full clarification on that until the 14th? Or uh, you, you did, and let me give you an example. It, the redevelopment powers law provides a fairly high-level list of what are qualified redevelopment costs. And when we were first discussing uh, the developer's hard costs, you know, on the surface, it looked like um, all the, you know, one or two or three of them qualified. But I've been doing this long enough to know that the devil's in the details. So what, what is the, uh, what is the pro forma, the schedule of values of the construction contract or so on look like the developer's pro forma? So we have some of that information now. That's where I picked up that bit about subsidizing an operating deficit. And there's some other things in there that don't belong. Um, that's just got to be drilled down in more detail. Uh, so again, on the surface, we've got uh, enough information for me to write the document. But in terms of funding a requisition, we, 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 and we know that some of the requested costs don't qualify, so the uh, payment limitation will decrease. Um, when it comes time to actually pay a requisition, it depends on what's attached. So there's a, there are checks and balances throughout this, um, but I, with the provisions, the protective provisions that I've included in here, um, and again, the, the document's not final, and you know, my final word depends on the final document, but I've been concerned all along that you know we don't buy a pig and a poke something that looks good that turns out not to be so we we have enough to get into the agreement i think it's going to be a good agreement i also think that we're going to have to take it step by step and, and trust but verify as we go through this so if a portion is found to be ineligible then those caps would decrease does that also mean that that ineligible portion basically doesn't get built um, the, the cap will decrease because the cap, one of the caps or two, will decrease because uh, what it's founded on the developer's application, and if the application shrinks because of an el eligible cost, then that cap will shrink. Does that answer your question? I think it's important to clarify, Dan. You said this yesterday in the meeting with Mark. You may not have, I, know you were the, I know you were there, Commissioner Hull. Yeah. But what the commission is approving is not the application. You're approving the community benefits agreement. Yeah. So it's what's in the community benefits agreement that's going to control. Am I saying that correctly, Dan? 
100% underscore twice with an exclamation mark at the end. <laughs> And of course, you know, Dan mentioned operational costs not being eligible, and of course that's a, a, a norm within TAD law, is that we're talking about hard costs. Uh, is that right, Dan? We're really not talking about, uh, we're not talking about operating. It, it, it is correct that we're talking about hard costs. Now, some soft costs would qualify, and gosh, y'all are uh, inviting me to get on my soapbox and talk about lawyer stuff, but I'll take that invitation to this extent. Um, what does this boil down to? <coughs> it boils down to whatever the developer spends, does it go into the tax digest? If it doesn't, it doesn't count because it's not producing any increment. Well, how do you know whether it goes into the tax digest? How firm is it? Is a, you know, an estimate, a letter of intent, is that firm enough? Well, the answer to that lies, and we're not issuing TAD bonds. But the answer to that question lies in creating the financing model if a TAD bond were going to be issued. And somebody working for us is going to come up with that number. If your numbers are solid enough and qualify, and you take the number that's solid and it's 15% or whatever percent of that, not 15% of the application and not 15% of whatever else may come up. It's 15% or whatever that percentage is of what's on the tax digest or what an investment banker working for us feels comfortable will be on the tax mm -hmm. digest in terms of uh, firm commitments from creditworthy counterparties and all that stuff. Uh, after some work on this, I feel pretty comfortable with that. I, if there's one way to do it is, is uh, you know, we're paying you a percentage of what you spend. That's not what this says. That's not what our policy says. The policy says pay a percent of the value, including, and it says estimated value. Well, estimate, okay, but it's not going to be an estimate that you can't take to the bank. That's what the document mm -hmm. says. Thanks for that, Dan. Follow-up, Carol? Yeah, so perhaps, you know, unless I'm missing the point completely, the example of the... Um, the youth development uh, program with the Boys and Girls Club, which is part of the, the uh, community benefits agreement. On that, there is some uh, real estate involved, right? The newly renovated, the building out and creating the 6,100 square foot feet of newly renovated mall space. Um, that will be leased to the Boys and Girls Club to kickstart their youth for force initiative at no cost. But then in, there's discussion of programming as well, as if the, there will be uh, support of the programming. It sounds to me like the hard cost for the newly renovated space could be covered by the TAD, but not the programming. Am I getting that correct? You're on the right path, and, and you've picked a very good example, because I've had a lot of internal debates with myself about that. I mean, there's, that line item has been questioned. Um, but the way I've resolved it, and I, I, this is legal and it's a policy matter as to whether you want to do it or not, but right now the document says the hard, not necessarily the hard cost, but a capitalized soft cost, mm -hmm. for example, like plans and specifications. That's a soft cost, but they get capitalized. But it's under the same umbrella. Do those costs of this physical asset go on the tax digest? If the answer to that is yes, then you go to the next question, is that asset title to the public sector? The document does not allow any costs to be paid that don't go to the public sector. Now that doesn't mean that it couldn't be, the, the um, facility couldn't be titled to the development authority or, or some other local authority <coughs> in the lease, but it means that title is vested in the public sector. Okay, that makes sense. Uh but does it, is there, there's also mention in here of developing programs. Is that all outside of the TAD money and how long it, it's, I, I was kind of, time passes more quickly than we think and, and funds run out. So I'm just curious how long, is, is this an indication that there's going to be support from this developer for these youth development programs? It, and, it's my understanding that the, the, the programming that would be things like coaches and facilitators are a separate cost outside of the TAD, 
but, but, but I think, Carol, you raise a good question, which is sort of the length of commitment of the physical space to a youth development activity, which is, of course, one of our four topical areas of interest within our TAD program generally. And, and, and so, Dan, could, could that length of commitment to a space for youth development programming be part of the community benefits agreement? It, it could be, and I, Mayor, when uh, I was speaking earlier about some details were left to be determined, such as the provisions of a lease or a license, that's the sort of thing I expected. In the state grant programs, they have a lot of experience with the state grant programs. I was uh, doing all of this when the Attorney General issued his uh, forgivable loans or unconstitutional ruling, and that's been the law in Georgia since the 19th century. Um, but it doesn't the law doesn't, the Constitution doesn't preclude <coughs> title ultimately leaving the public sector as long as the public benefit has been mm -hmm. obtained. Um, and I just don't see any way, with, particularly with the time pressure that we've got, uh, to get into all of that in the community benefit agreement. I, I can add, it's mm -hmm. not in there now, but I can add a provision for a purchase option or even a nominal purchase option once the public benefits been secure and leave that for another day. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I don't see any way that the programming costs are going to qualify. That's, that's right. not ever going to be capitalized, so that's not going to qualify for TED. Wouldn't be my expectation. Well, I'm, I, Sorry. I, I, I'm following up on that one. I mean, that the, the expectation, I, I understand that, but the wording is such that it indicates, I mean, is, is the developer or the company involved, are they indicating that they're going to be supporting the program? Because it says we're working on arts enhancement program that indicates they're not just indicating a space. Is there also programming that's going to be supported? I think in our, in our application, we mentioned the fact that, I mean, two of our developers are huge supporters of the Boys and Girls Club, okay. and they are supporting programming efforts outside of this request. The okay. request that we're making, we believe, qualifies. Now, that's certainly something that Dan okay. and our attorney will have to get together and do. Uh, they extensively support and will continue to support that, and to Mayor Gersh's point, uh, it's, it's our opinion and our intent uh, to provide whatever agreement falls within the bounds of the um, Redevelopment Powers Act that would allow the capture of that 30-year time frame whereby the Boys and Girls Club get to utilize that space for $100 a year uh, versus what the rent would be, which mm -hmm. is three and a half million dollars over that 30-year time frame to be able to do that. And we believe that there's a way that, that Dan and, and Ken and uh, Judd can work together to, to, to come up with that and, and appropriate it. Jesse, did you have follow up? Yeah, I'm trying to think of how to get a. I, I mean, I guess the. Well, yeah, we'll stick with this example of the, the youth facility. I mean, if this application was originally contemplating a certain amount of money going towards operating costs. And I'm, I'm hearing now this discussion, but like, let's, let's just say, you know, and then the TAD funding is ruled to be ineligible for that after we've gone through and voted on this. Um, what's, what's to keep that space that through the provision we've just discussed might be allocated for a youth development space, what's to keep that space from just sitting vacant and not actually serving the community, community benefit that we're expecting it to because the TAD funds are not an eligible way of paying for it if they don't find another way to pay for it. And then I guess copy paste that phenomenon to anything else. Let's say that the TAD funding is found to be ineligible for subsidizing the rent for these affordable units. You know, if there's not another way found to be paid for that, then how do we assure that that actually happens? It, 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 excuse me for interrupting, but we've had some progress with that discussion of that line item that looked like a rent subsidy. Um, and it's not. It's the it's a private construction cost allocable to the affordable units. It's not an intangible like operating cost. It's a physical asset, and uh, we might very well see a structure in which the housing authority or some other local authority owns title to a building or so. I mean that that remains to be seen. But that's that's not an example of money, a TAD money getting spent on non-capital assets. It turned out to be a, a capital asset, 
And, and I can add, I mean, I, you didn't ask, but I'll add this, that there's nothing to stop the developer from paying those programming costs out of the developer's money that doesn't come from TAD funds, and that can be included in the document as a performance commitment. I don't know how receptive the developer will be to that, but it's legal to require it. Others? So that would be required in the language of the CBA? It can be put in there. I mean, to, to reference activity outside of the TAD funds. Is that what you're saying, Dan? Yeah, there, there's more money in the world than TAD funds. I mean, there's developer profit, for example. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess I'm hoping that this community benefits agreement that we approve is going to find a way to ensure that each of these things that are listed on the TAD funding request are also assured to still happen, even if the funding from the TAD is not eligible to fulfill the entire cost. That makes sense. That makes sense to me. Does that, it, 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 or, I'm seeing a nod here. Yeah, no, I see, yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah. I, I, under, I, I do understand that, and the application is taken into account in drafting the uh, community benefits agreement along with the, a lot of other things. But as Judd said earlier, we'll be voting on the community benefits agreement, not on the application. Carol? I mean, the short of it is you can put that in there. I don't know if the developers are going to agree to that. But there are certain things, I mean, that Dan's reiterated, are not merely paid for using TAB funds. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess we're, we're getting presented with a list of things that we're going to consider as being funded with TAD funding when we go through and vote on this. And then if we find out after the fact well, that some of these things are actually ineligible to be funded through the TAD, I would hate for that to turn into, well, then it just doesn't happen because there wasn't TAD money for it. Well, I think that's so where you need to... Everything I think, else happens. I think you've got to reorient your thinking you, you have to list to what, what Dan has said that... He's pretty much said several times that not all those items are going to be payable. Mm -hmm. And so you shouldn't be expecting that. He's indicated that, that there's going to, there will be an agent who will review, and if they're the right kind of capital cost, they'll be payable, a certain percentage of them, and, that, and that's what will happen. I mean, so I, am, I re, am I restating what you said wrongly, Dan? That, that, that's correct, Judge. I don't the want to be a misunderstanding. The community benefits agreement requires a developer to build a project, which is described in as much detail as we've got, regardless of whether the TAD funds amount to 10% or 15% or if conditions are satisfied higher than that. But So what we're talking about is the um, whether or not the developer has to reach into his own pocket to do that. And the, there is a section, as I mentioned, of the agreement that refers to uh, uh, performance commitments. And what we're talking about now is, is listed on that. Okay. And if I need to make sure that there is added to that the, the uh, programming costs, I can do it. A, a TAD agreement like this is not about operating costs and expenses. It's, it's about capital items. So when you go beyond that, it's more like a memorandum of understanding with an economic development project where you bargain for things like jobs and so on. But um, again, I'm, I'm happy to, to make sure it reads that way. Um, I do think the developer's expectation was that, that would be paid out of TAD funds, and that being these um, programming charges, and they're not going to be. So uh, we can put it in there, and then it's up to the developer to weigh whether or not the rest of the deal is uh, so good that they're willing to take on that liability, because that's what it would be. Uh, Manager Williams, had a follow-up? Uh, just a couple of points. So uh, one is that in tandem with this, and, and another thing that's driving the February 7th vote versus the 14th is the approval of the plan development. So the PD is coming through, and that is a bit of an anchor, too. That's what... <laughs> The developer is committing to in that particular rezoning that these things will get built now it doesn't speak to a lot of the intangible mm -hmm. programming that you're, you're speaking of and Dan if I might I just want to check this by you but so you know the Commission's created six TADs it's our first you know real foray into this and TADs can take different for, for, forms and we've uh, are these agreements and these processes and uh, we certainly learned a lot I think everybody going through this together and I would say that uh, there seems to be some concern that not everything has been defined at this point. 
Um, and, and, you know, had this been a bond financing where there's going to be bonds sold on the front end to pay for certain things, Dan, I think it's safe to say that it would be a lot more structured and defined than it is right now. Is that, would you say that? God, we would not be able to vote next week on a bond deal, that's for sure. <laughs> so, and that, and that, I'm just sharing this with y'all because we went through this. That was abundantly clear and made abundantly clear, and that's what uh, kind of put this into more of a pay-go approach as you've come to know it. And, uh, and there is a model for this in Atlanta where uh, they're asking for so much for eligible reimbursed costs. They have a sense of what they'd like to do. A project verification agent's hired on the back end, and then they come forward and see if they can get that approved. So, Dan, Dan was that a pretty good summary of the difference between and the, 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 I guess the, the separation between the level of definition we might expect in one version of this versus where we're at now? It's an excellent summary. I don't know if that helps y'all, but thanks for that. Uh, Mike? Sure. I, I guess, and I don't know if this is a, an adequate um, um, comparison or not, but it kind of reminds me of, a, of the Caterpillar deal where, where they, they were, we, we helped them with, with building the project and there were clawbacks if they didn't meet the didn't meet the standards as they went on year by year. Mm -hmm. Am I right in saying that? Th that that's accurate. And, and, you're, and I hear you saying that with the project verification person. Mm -hmm. And while we were providing Caterpillar with uh, dollars for capital costs, right. some of their requirement was about operation, including the number of employees that would be in that facility. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's an excellent point, Commissioner Hamby. And a little bit different in this stand, uh, because I'm not sure, Dan, there's necessarily clawbacks because we're not fronting any money. It's only money that's generated by right. mm -hmm. development. Yeah. They, they so, wouldn't necessarily get the money. That's right. It would be, it would be funds just simply not delivered because the terms had not been met. Right. Yeah. If I can offer a couple of observations, uh, the manager's correct that uh, we're funding reimbursement. But I built a pretty wide moat between the developer and the money. So it's, it's not enough to spend money. It's got to be spent on what you were supposed to spend it on, when you were supposed to spend it to the level of quality that you were supposed to spend it on, and so on. And all of that's subject to verification. And there are limits, on, as we've been discussing, on how much gets funded. There are also default provisions. And if the developer doesn't perform, if he doesn't hit those benchmarks, uh, you, you, you reach a point where we can terminate this agreement. And at that point in time, we, we're not, the money, the developer spent the money and re reimbursed it. Uh, the only way we can go after the developer for money, except for breach of contract, is if he's overpaid because there's an adjustment in the tax digest or something like that. Um, but the protection there is the fact that to the point when and if we quit paying or terminate the agreement, the project's been built the way it was supposed to be because he doesn't get any money unless he does that. Thanks, Dan. That's helpful. Well, I, for what it's worth, I guess I'll say that the two things that are sticking out to me on here, you know, one of them you quelled my fear around, which is the affordable housing being tied to a capital cost. Um, it, I guess it'd be helpful. The other thing is obviously this, um, the, the venue for the Boys and Girls Club having youth development programming actually operating out of it and not just being a vacant venue. Um, but I, I'd be curious if we could get maybe some kind of a memo on what are the other things that there's concerns around so we can make sure that so we can decide whether we need some kind of provision in there in the community benefits agreement to try to make sure that that's seen through Dan I don't know if you've got any response to that generally I mean you're, you're saying that there's several things we've happened to discuss two specifically one that you're saying actually isn't going to be on that list of likely to be ineligible and one that likely is going to be on that list of likely to be ineligible. So I guess it would be helpful to know what else might be ineligible. And so, Commissioner, are you looking for a, a punch list or essentially a chart of, you know, the items that we have in front of us with some short narrative around their perceived eligibility or um, yeah if we can't have the it confirmed until the 14th can we have a list of things that we're keeping our eye on in advance of the 7th so we can make sure that if we wanted language in the CBA to address that it's there yeah 
Dan, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I mean, I, I guess as I look at, at at the bulky line items, we're talking about something like 15 areas. I, if that's a question for me, I'm not following the question. Could somebody restate it, please? So, Dan, in um, in the proposed use of TAD funds chart that we have, um, we have these areas uh, of public infrastructure, affordable housing, youth development work, and then of course financing costs, and then a dollar value attached to each of those subcomponents. And I think what Commissioner Hool is asking for is some short narrative from you to identify, yes, this is clearly eligible, or this is eligible under some circumstances or with some caveats. D does that cover kind of what you're getting at, Commissioner Hool? Yes. Okay, yes. So that's the question, Dan. Is, is well, that that you know, the, the answer is this. Of the items in the request, there were three that were, were mentioned by name in the definition of reimbursable costs in the redevelopment powers law. So I'm pretty confident of three. Um, the, the problem is that, and I, I can say this on a high level, aside from in addition to those three, um, there are a number of others, maybe all of the others, that probably fit uh, at a high level within the definition and the redevelopment powers law of what's re uh, reimbursable and what is not. Mm -hmm. The problem is, just, and I'm, I'm using the operating deficit as an example because uh, that's all I can remember right now. Um, when you look at what's actually being requested, it doesn't qualify. So I, I, I hesitate, in fact, I won't. Uh, create a document that says anything that can be generally described as blah 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 gets reimbursed <coughs> even though the reality is that it's not reimbursable and the problem is there's no way to know that until you, you get the actual requisition with the backup data. Now if this were a construction project going back to the bond example that was a very good example where you have plans and specifications and you're you know, going to build a parking for the Classic Center or something like that, you know exactly what you're paying for. You've got a construction contract. You've got an architect. You've got an owner's representative. You've got all those things on the front end. And so you can look at that and say, yeah, this is a, this is a normal construction contract with hard costs and capitalizable soft costs and everything's fine. But this is not that. And it's not going to be. There's no way to make that determination now, which is why the agreement's written the way it is. And so, Dan, just generally speaking, you know, at the point when we do, in fact, have those construction plans that have gone through our plans review mm -hmm. process uh, and concrete, steel, lumber, and other components are on order, then we'll be able to say, yes, that's a reimbursable expense um, because we've reviewed it, but we're just not at that point until that comes to pass. Is that correct? That, that's exactly right. And there are even protections in the agreement against overpaying. So, and that's not, you know, necessarily a kickback thing. It's just overpaying. You want the developer to treat this TED money like it's their money. Um, and so that's in there, too. Uh, I, I think that's... I, I wouldn't release this document if I didn't feel comfortable, and again, I got to see the final document because I'm, I'm going to have to make some changes based on tonight, unless I felt like the public interest was protected and that it worked, even without having um, an architect's cost estimate and a schedule of values from a contractor like you'd have with a, a con financing a construction project. Uh, but unless a commission just decides not to go forward, then that's the best that we can do. And the question is, is it good enough? And I think with the right document, yes, it is good enough. And if the concern is to make sure that ineligible costs get paid somehow, the way to do that is to put it on the developer. And um, at least with respect to the youth, youth development, based on the input I've got tonight, I'll do that. I can't make the developer agree to it, but I can put it in the document, and I will put it in the document. Uh, thanks for that, Dan. That's helpful. Uh, Ovita, you had a question? So tonight's meeting and information is really, I, you know, I thought I knew what I was doing when I came in here. Now I'm totally, totally confused. Uh, tonight was really to try to get this move for the seventh vote That's because right. of the PD. Is that right? Yeah. 
we, we, we would essentially like those two things to be lined up closely. So the two things, tell me the two things. So again. the two things are the approval of the planned unit development, right? Uh -huh. so, so that's the design, what, what the full expectations are, and of course in the context for, uh -huh. for the public viewing of a planned unit <laughs> development, that, that really gets down to the very granular level exactly uh -huh. what that's going to look like on the ground. And then separately, the community benefits agreement is that sort of financial arrangement where in the context of a TAD, these reimbursable expenses uh, are, are funded through the rise in value of the property. So those two things are moving <laughs> together simultaneously, right? The, Very close together. But, but now on the 14th, when Dan gets the data that he needs, that I think some of that maybe I'm not the only commissioner confused um, what options if I, well, that's the, the part well, I'm the, well the 14th date came up I think w what that relates to is right now when we created this mall area TAD we entered into an intergovernmental agreement with the Board of Education mm -hmm. Clark County School District where right. they agreed to commit their increment to be part of uh, this TAD. Mm -hmm. They didn't do it. This is the only one they joined with us that we have an IGA for. Uh, and that's important because 60% of the TAD revenue will come from the Board of Education, approximately 40% right. from us. And that IGA says that the term uh, of the term of that IGA runs through December 31st, 2040 except if there are bonds issued, then it can go longer, but there's no bonds issued. So what that means is we have to amend that IGA. We both have to, we have to agree, and the school district has to agree to run it out for 30 years, which will be concurrent with the amount of time that the developer is requesting to receive TAB funds. And so when Dan referred to that uh, December, to that February 14th date, he meant the date by which both this body and the school district, the uh, Board of Education, need to approve that amendment to the IGA. Because if the school district doesn't approve the IGA, then uh, this was discussed yesterday in the MARC committee meeting, uh, then we don't, the developer says we basically don't have a deal. You follow what I'm saying? And, and, that, and, and that's the understanding. So that's, the, that's, the, yeah, that's what we're talking about there. Now, as far as this verification, we're not going to know on February 14th any right. more about whether these things are eligible than we know right now. Okay. And, and, and other than what Dan's told you tonight, there's just certain things that aren't, you know, operating cost, and uh, we're not going to know. Okay, so the questions that have totally confused me, was this discussed in your earlier meeting of yesterday? Yeah, there were these concerns, same concerns raised by, especially the members of the Board of Education, one of okay. Dr. Anderson. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there were legitimate concerns, so maybe yeah. that is what um, Commissioner Hull is trying to get some clarification. But I'm, I'm good now. I know where I'm at. Not as deep as this discussion, but Dr. Anderson raised the concerns related to eligibility. Okay. The mayor raised some concerns related to ensuring the financial viability of the development of the project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but not as detailed as this discussion. Okay. I'm good. Carol? Okay. Again, to clarify all these parts for myself as well. So there's $180 million of community benefits agreement projects that are part of this that, it, that we don't know if they're all going to be like approved in the end or not. But that's okay because we're actually not paying for any of it up front. The developer needs all of these papers to get their financing. They're not getting any money to us. Uh, they're going to be putting money out first before we are. They're the ones who are taking the risk. Correct, right? At this point. Correct. Um, Correct. The second thing is the construction phase of the Boys and Girls Club property. Is that the phasing? Is that included in the the community benefits agreement? It, it is supposed to be. I don't have that data. I've got the developer spreadsheets. The only thing I've got with the dates in it. But the agreement is marked to require that sort of thing with each of the components and that's one of the components right. to be broken out into phases with the same data given for that as given for the multifamily and the rest of the housing so again that's an example that's a very good example of what we don't have now 
But what we've got to have in my book before this agreement is even signed, much less becomes effective. You would transfer me to the last question. It's Wednesday. It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. It's February 1st. So we're voting on this complicated thing next Tuesday. The 7th. The 7th. So when, when should we anticipate getting a copy of this community benefits agreement that we're going to vote on? Well, this, I, I really am tempted to make a little joke there, but it probably wouldn't be funny. <laughs> and don't make no jokes. <laughs> in, 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 all, in all honesty, I've got to make changes tonight and tomorrow on this. I'll distribute it to our internal working group, make sure the folks working on it from the community's perspective are okay with what I've done. Um, then it will go to the developer and their council on a very quick turnaround and see today's <coughs> Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. If I hear back from the developer on Friday and we don't have problems that necessitate a negotiating session, you might get it as early as Friday, but it might be as late as Monday. If I can make one point to that, the mark has to vote on this community exactly. benefits agreement. So y'all could see a, a draft version of it so that way you can understand it, but the final version will not be to you until late Monday because they'll be voting on it uh, Monday f at 1. Um, so their last meeting is Monday, February 6th from 1 to 2.30. Not for they have a meeting on Friday as well, don't they? Yes, ma'am. So it will essentially be this in a full detail. So that'll be my next <coughs> slide to go over that timeline. Okay. Uh, yeah, we get uh, follow up with Ovita then, Jesse. So, with all the detail at the end of the day, if the mark does not support whatever the, the recommendation is, it's nothing for us to do as a commission anyway, right? That would be correct. So, so it'd be, have to vote. but we'll still have to vote. But Which we, but the agreement is the mark with the school district representatives is the basis for. It has to proceed our it, vote. District. Mm -hmm. So well, I, I know it's, yeah. it's it's the the committee, Carol. Okay. It's the committee. It's, it's the step. mark. Well, it's just, the mark. Just to be clear, and, and we have other tad tads, of course, and. Uh, and I know, Dan, when we were putting this together, uh, there was the desire to have the school district join. Um, and so the mark was a, a committee created just for this particular But for tab. this committee. That's I right. mean, for this yeah. project. And at the time, uh, I remember Dan advising that, you know, typically the mayor and commission would be the last stop and decision maker on those things. And the commission at the time decided to share that uh, responsibility. responsibility with the mark and so it is a bit unusual but that was what was done at the time to gain the school's partnership uh, Jesse then Mike yeah I, I, so something that came up in the mark meeting that I was maybe hoping staff could uh, revisit for us um, the development team's attorney mr. neighbors uh, kept using the term de-risking um, that like their approach switching from a bond structure to this PAYGO structure took the risk and moved it away from the you know Clark County government and CCSD and on to the development team and there was some kind of back and forth there about you know hoping to get some clarification from staff on those assertions so could you kind of give us just like a helicopter level explanation of what our risk is or is not with this structure <coughs> Moving forward, I know we kind of touched upon this earlier in the conversation, but that feels like a well. Of course, Attorney Drake and uh, Dan can can chime in. My understanding of this, uh, as it's been explained, is that in a bond scenario where they want the money up front, which is not atypical, uh, then there's a revenue bond that's issued, and it's issued under the um, local government's name. Now. The local government, I don't believe, Dan, is tasked with repaying that if a developer went into default, but it does impact your credit mm -hmm. rating. Uh, and then, uh, so in this case, there is no bond. Uh, the, 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 um, the, the government is not having to do that, issue that, put its credit capacity at, at, at any type of uh, risk there. And instead, the developer will access funds in a reimbursable pay-go amount. So, there is less risk, I would agree, in that scenario than with a bond. And Judd or Dan, would you add anything to that? 
No, that, that's 100% correct. I mean, the, if, if a bond were issued, it is a revenue bond. The revenue is the increment, and that increment is pledged to the bondholders, but it's the bondholders who are at risk. However, that ties up our increment for the duration of the bond, uh, and the developer has said, well, this, in the PAYGO structure, this is all at the developer's risk. Well, it is and it isn't. You know, we've got a 30-year deal here, and this looks like it could be a transformational project like the Gulf if, if it works. But part of this is making sure that the community doesn't get into a, a deal that, that goes south, that ties us up in a contract and all sorts of bad things. So it is clearly, clearly, first of all, it, it, we couldn't issue, the only person who'd buy a bond at this stage is a developer. Mm -hmm. So that's not going to happen, uh, and it shouldn't happen. What should happen is what we're doing, which is a pay-go agreement with all the protections that we've got built into it. And the community's protected because we're not fronting any money, and we're protected uh, in seeing that the money that we do pay goes to reimburse costs that should have been incurred in keeping with the Community Benefits Agreement, and a few other things, too. So this this is the right direction if the Commission is, is comfortable with it. Thanks, Dan. Uh, and Caitlin, remind us, what, what, what else do we have tonight? Uh, so we have, a, briefly, I'll just go over the timeline, and then the developer um, mm -hmm. will give their presentation So um, to get into more details of their application from their perspective. Great. Just wanted to check in on <laughs> You're good. Uh, I'll, be, go ahead, I'll, be brief, I'll be brief, Mayor. I was just going to speak to the risk part of it. And, and I know we all realize this, that, uh, that the developer's putting the money into doing this project. If the developer is not putting the money into the project, there's not, a, there's not any sort of increment. There's mm -hmm. not any money going to the developer. Mm -hmm. So when we approve the PD on Tuesday, or, or not, I'm hoping we do, but when we approve that PD on Tuesday, we, that PD is going to show us what the developer has to build. And if it's not getting billed, then then his tax increment won't go up. So, so the the increment is being paid for out of the out from the developer and based on what he's building. So, I just want to point that out as far as as far as the risk and mm -hmm. where the money's where the money's coming from. That's right. And I think uh, Amanda <coughs> Williams had one more point before we move on to the next piece. And Commissioner Thornton, this might speak a little bit to the order and why we're doing things. So. So the developer does not own the property at present, and they have an option on the property, which I think expires. It's been extended time and again, and it expires in the February, and seller is ready to kind of move on. And so the PD, if you know, is pretty, those are, you know, customized, if you will, plan development, but it locks that in, that property into that. So the developer is, is asserting that they cannot do this project but for the TAD assistance. They don't own the property. They're about to lock the property into a development plan. You know, we tried to, you know, see if we could push this a little bit longer, but the notice requirements around the PD was such that it had to be voted on the 7th. And so that's why this all seems very rushed, but we're, th these are the, the circumstances that have driven us to this, if that's any help. All right. Dan, we really appreciate it. Uh, th thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's, it's been a pleasure. It's been very beneficial uh, to me to be involved in this discussion. And if y'all will excuse me, I've got some typing to do. All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll look forward to that uh, fruits of your labor. Yes, sir. Thanks, everybody. Good Thanks. night. Thank you. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Thank you. <coughs> Thank so, you. <coughs> All right, Katie. Just to, to do a quick overview of the timeline so everybody kind of knows yeah. Yeah. new dates because they have changed since I came. Um, earlier this month so of course we're here tonight for y'all's work session the mall area redevelopment committee also known as the mark um, they will meet on friday they will hopefully get that financial analysis that i was um, previewing earlier for the updated application they will also discuss the community benefits agreement with dan and they um, will vote on that community benefits agreement on Monday, February the 6th. So then that will come to you all um, next Tuesday. I hope to have that financial analysis to y'all before before February the 7th, but heaven forbid I, that is the last date, but I hope not. 
Um, but then on that night, y'all will uh, be voting on the community benefits agreement as well, along with that plan development. Um, so I just made that new note of that the Clark County School District Board of Education meeting, they will consider and vote upon the IGA to extend their participation in the TAD as Judd has alluded to. Well, I just want to point out that's a tentative date. I don't know if that's been confirmed in the Board okay. of Education vote. Uh, it was discussed as a possible date by myself and Mr. Pruitt, the attorney for the Board of Education, but I haven't received confirmation that's when they're going to vote. Got it. Okay. So that is the timeline. So let me pull up the developers. So, do, do so our last action on this is scheduled to be next Tuesday the 7th, but the last action on this whole project will actually be after that when the school board votes on extending that IGA. That is how I understand it. So we, the, the we don't real vote. final action on this is actually that school board vote. Is that correct? Yeah. We don't vote on the extending the IGA? We, we will, too. We'll vote on that at our... Uh, That'll be another document for you to approve along the CBA community benefits agreement. Along you'll be you'll be voting on the plan unit development. Uh, uh, you mean on, and, on, and the on February seventh? On February seventh. Yes. Okay, okay. So that's so an update to the IGA. Will okay, be yeah. Okay, that's what I did. Saw it then. Okay, so I will turn it over to the development team now. So. Um, I will let them introduce themselves and go through their presentation. Thanks, Kate. Evening. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, Mr. Mayor, Commission, it's really it's really an honor to be before you tonight with this um, with this development. It's an incredible development. I've been working in Athens Park County for over 25 years now. A lot of you I've known for a long time. Uh, this is uh, what I do, Caitlin. Oh. Yes. oh, it just disappeared up there. Okay. <laughs> this is. <laughs> All right. Too much technology for me right now. Uh, as I said, this this is truly a transformational development, particularly for the the west side of of Athens. Uh, without a doubt, the most transformational development that uh, we've been involved with in the in the city since I've been been here. Um, I'm grateful for this special call meeting tonight for you guys to get a preview. Uh, grateful for Dan being here with us tonight to help answer some questions. Uh, I know we have everybody working overtime uh, to get this done, and I certainly appreciate your patience with that. Uh, there's a couple things that came up tonight that I want to address, and then I'm going to turn it over to some of my colleagues to, to give you a little more information. Uh, first of all, the members of the team today, we have uh, Ken Neighbors is our TAD attorney has been working with Dan. He's here and we'll speak with you. Scott Haynes, uh, my director of operations and landscape architect from my office here in town. He's been working in Athens for a number of years, uh, is here and will present the project itself. Uh, and then we have Brian Liu and Mark Jennings and Zach McElroy, the development team uh, behind Ken there. Uh, something came up earlier in Caitlin's presentation about the, the depth of the team. Uh, just some quick statistics, and we'll be happy to provide this uh, before your actual voting meeting uh, on paper, but uh, just some examples. Brian Liu was um, head of development for the Buckhead Atlanta project. It was a billion dollar development. He's developed over two million square feet of condominium, office and retail and hotel developments with a value of $1.5 billion. Um, Zach and Mark have, have developed residential and commercial construction uh, in the amount of $1.6 billion in various communities around the state. Uh, and w &A Engineering, just a little snapshot of our work with uh, multifamily and mixed-use development only, uh, we've done about 15 to $20 billion worth of student multifamily and multifamily and retail developments across 46 states. So I think you've got a sufficiently deep team to manage this project. Uh, I would also tell you it's a rare occasion when you get a project like this and the stars align. And what, what do I mean when I say that? I mean that we have the will of the community. We have a project that seems like has been a, a, a very accepting, uh, accepted by the community. I mean, just like you, I follow the social media threads and, and all that stuff. And it's rare for us to bring a project before the mayor and commission uh, and have such positive responses we've had to this particular project. We have a willing developer who's not only a willing developer, but a local developer and a well-financed developer. And we have the mechanisms to be able to create this impactful development, the TAD mechanisms that you and the school board have agreed to put in place here. Um, what does all that mean? At the end of the day, 
Blaine said it the first time tonight. This is an extreme and, and succinct but-for scenario. But for the approval of this TAD and the availability of these $189 million, this mall does not get <coughs> redeveloped at this time. I mean, that's the, that's the end of the, that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell right there. We're confident uh, in talking with our attorney. We can work through these issues, these, these issues with Dan with regard to what is eligible, what's not eligible. We have full faith and confidence in the attorneys to be able to find a way to execute on this for us to be able to receive these funds in such a way that you are guaranteed the product that, that we are proposing and that those costs are eligible and it follows all the TAD increment, um, that follows all the Georgia Redevelopment Powers Law, which interestingly, uh, just to put this out there because there's been some misinformation, absolutely and unequivocally allows for a, a time period of up to 30 years. It also absolutely and unequivocally allows for up more than 15%. Your own code allows for more than 15% if it is a development of substantial regional impact. And just for that one sentence right there, this is probably the most impactful project that is available in the city of Athens in its entirety. I can't think of one bigger, but if you want to point to something and say, hey, what makes this a development of regional impact? We did have to submit a development of regional impact study. Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with that terminology. It goes to the RDC. It gets evaluated by the surrounding communities because state law dictates that that be followed in cases like this when you have zones that are this big and this impactful to those regions. Um, another thing that, that came up tonight uh, is that it was mentioned that we were getting 29% of the value of the project. And I want to be crystal clear and, and tell you that we're getting 29% of the value of the project and we're capping it at $189 million. So it's, it's both, right? Um, Dan mentioned several times that we would be, that, that he is uh, proposing a 15%, but I did hear Dan say that it could go higher than that, assuming that our tax increment was higher, right? What we're asking for is 29% of the increment at the time that the increment rises. So when we build something, the increment will change. We can get up to 29% of that. We build something else, the increment will change again. We can get up to 29% of that. And when we reach $189 million, and we have two different scenarios that we've submitted on, one scenario was from our <coughs> conservative consultant that that number would be reached in year 29 and a half. One scenario was from your consultant that that scenario reaches it's probably in more like year 25 or 26. But we're asking for the 30 year horizon. We're asking for a cap of 189 million and we're asking for 29% of the project value. I'm gonna let Ken get into a lot to more of the details about how the nuances of all that work under the TAD and I'll move on to something, uh, to something else that um, I wanted to address with you tonight the housing requirement, the affordable housing requirement. We understand that uh, it's preferred uh, that it be 20% at 80% of AMI for 20 years. 20 years is the maximum horizon, I believe, and the attorneys can verify, and the city manager can verify, that they can require in, in your inclusionary housing ordinance to be done. There's a cost to affordable housing. We've added that cost into the TAD. We are not supplementing rents with that cost. What we are doing is providing housing that looks just like all the other housing in the development. So if you were to rent a three bedroom apartment under affordable housing and a three bedroom apartment not, they look identical. They have the same kitchens, the same bathrooms, the same appliances, the same countertops, and there's a cost to that. So our reimbursement that we're asking for under the TAD is to buy down the cost of those units, to supplement the cost of those units so that they can be rented. And you say, why, do we do, why are we doing 10% instead of the 20? One is, this is a massive project. You're getting north of 200 beds of affordable housing, which as far as I know is 10 times the amount that's been done in the past uh, under any scenario lately. Uh, but the second reason is, is because if we did 10% more, we would have to request more TAD funds. We would have to buy down the cost of those units and supplement that construction cost. So what we did in turn is kind of flip it around a little bit and say, look, we can't, without asking for more TAD funds, which we don't know if the project can support, we are asking for, to be able to give you guys or give the community 
uh, the benefit of those affordable housing units for twice the time length. So instead of a 20 year horizon, we're giving it to you for 40 year horizon. And we believe that that is, you know, in combination with the fact that this is a massive project in the number of units, that that is equitable in this case. Um, with regard to the, to the TAD funds and, and how they all get sorted out and, and what can be paid for, what can't be paid for, I'll direct you to what your uh, city manager said earlier. This is very complex for us to dovetail under all your rules, regulations, zoning laws, and TAD uh, uh, Redevelopment Act clauses because we do have a plan development. And Scott's going to walk you through that plan in a few minutes. And the plan development is really your guarantee of what you see is what you get. It always has been in Clark County. Mm -hmm. I've been working with Brad for 25 years. There's very limited ability to change things around in a plan development, particularly the big elements. How many units, how many parking spaces, the sidewalks. There was a question last night at the Mark Committee, well, will, will the sidewalks be in before we reimburse you for sidewalks? We can't get a CO on a single unit out there in the first phase of the development until everything that's shown on the plan development that you're going to be approving mm -hmm. has been implemented. So it all ties together, which is also a reason why it's taken us a long time to line it up. And again, I'm sorry for that. Which brings me to, I'm going to try to use this clicker. There we go. A little bit of the timeline of this project, a little bit of the history of this project, because I think it's important for you to understand that while it seems like a tremendous rush tonight uh, to get things done and while we appreciate everybody's uh, focus to do that this has been going on for quite some time uh, they started looking at this project in in early 2001 uh, put the project under contract it takes about six months to do the, the first round of plans that were submitted and they were submitted for an initial pd in in 2021 it went to the planning commission the plan was not well received um, i heard the term the other day it was kind of a Lego plan. They took what was out there at the mall and they stacked some Legos in there and took out some parking and stacked some buildings in there. And that's it. That's what they did. They removed some of the impervious surface. That was the plan the developer initially submitted. That was without the benefit of community involvement. That was without the benefit of staff involvement. That was without the benefit of going to planning commission. Once they got to planning commission and got the staff report, as you'll hear from Scott, uh, there was a tremendous amount of pushback on the plan itself to the point uh, that they found new consultants, which brought us to the table. Uh, we got involved in May of 2022. Uh, we asked for an extended table through the Planning Commission to be able to revise the plan. Not, let me take that back, not to revise the plan, but to start over and develop a plan that was in the best interest of Athens Clark County, its community, its zoning code, its comprehensive land use plan, its desire to utilize TADS to provide affordable housing and public infrastructure. And Scott and his team have worked tirelessly with the developer, with planning staff, with dozens, half a dozen departments, met with you guys, met with the community, had community meetings that Jesse was gracious enough to help us host and put together. One of the best community meetings I've ever had in Athens when we got there and we presented our plan that we had developed. Uh, in conjunction with all the comments from staff. We believe we have taken into account and addressed in some way, shape, form, or fashion every comment, not only from the previous plan, but also comments that came up during the process. An example of that would be the sidewalk interconnection between uh, one of the roads back to a neighborhood that doesn't exist today. We're unable to put that sidewalk in because it's a public right of way, but we found a way to make it work by proffering some dollars that would go into a bucket to be able to build that sidewalk. So we tried to hit every aspect of that. Um, the last thing I'll say about this is if we look on down, you see that we received unanimous approval from the Planning Commission. We've received unanimous approval and positive comments from the Citizens Committee that was appointed to be heard before the MAR Committee. Again, unlike any other project that I've really been involved with in athens Clark County in my 25-year history here, but what does it take to get there over a two- or three-year period of time? And, and, and Blaine, city manager, was exactly right. We are in a crunch. These guys have had this property under contract to purchase for over two years now. 
the developer that current the, the owner that currently owns the mall has said no more you buy it at the end of february or you don't buy it and you lose all your earnest money to boot because we've had to go back and renegotiate this contract so many times we have north of a million dollars in earnest money that we've spent to date on this project we have north of 1.7 million dollars in pre-development costs that have been spent with consultants design consultants architect our firm geotechnical studies and why do we have to spend that much because we are guaranteeing you tuesday night that the plan that scott is going to present to you will and can be built the way it's shown on the plan and we have the developers that are willing to invest 80 north of you know, 50 to 80 million dollars in the initial phases of this project that they have to put in in equity to be able to go borrow the money then to develop the horizontal infrastructure and it all ties together remember it's all one big plan we have to build the roads we have to build the roundabouts we have to build the sidewalks no that doesn't increase the tax increment right so guess what we get no money back for building that until we build vertical construction where your assessor will go out and change the tax digest and add to the increment and we understand that and the development team that's here with me tonight understands that and understands how many dollars it's going to take from them from their equity to be able to, to construct and build this incredible project in Athens Park County so um, I really appreciate your time tonight and your patience with this process I'm going to turn it over to Scott and let him take you through the the plans that we've developed for the plan development Uh, good evening my name is scott haynes uh, before i begin discussing the plan I, I just wanted to say two things um, first if you've heard this information already i appreciate you sitting through it again i know many of you have uh, taken part in some of these things before and so some of this will be repetitive but also um, last uh, yesterday afternoon we had a meeting with the uh, marc group and after that we had the benefit of having questions asked to us and some some new insights and so we rearranged our slide deck a little bit from that meeting just wanted to mention that we will be uh, presenting that information back to the mark group too so everybody has the benefit of the same information when when dealing with these things um, i'd like to start by looking at what the existing conditions look like today on the ground today you can see you can see here a survey of uh, what it looks like today <laughs> Um, what you see in green is what is to remain of the mall, and what you see in red is what is to be removed. Just for a little bit of orientation, you can see here, this is Belk. Okay. Where's Macy's? Okay. We'll note that Belk is part of the remaining portion of the building, um, and they have rights of approval for redevelopment of this plan. Uh, they also have a say in maintaining both view corridors to their location in addition to surface parking requirements and that's important to note because it's one of the complex pieces that's led us to the plan that you'll see here in a second so here's the slide of the proposed plan you can see use is outlined in color in the key we heard a lot of things from staff and uh, also in the planning commission meeting that led us to this plan uh, we heard a grid style development we heard the term auxiliary downtown be used they want the incorporation of the surrounding areas to avoid pod type development. We heard the need for sidewalks along Huntington in addition to uh, overall pedestrian improvements. We heard the need to incorporate a transit station uh, and enhance roadway infrastructure using things such as traffic circles to aid in the entering and exiting of traffic. In an effort to weave this project into the fabric of the surrounding neighborhood, we considered both Improving, con improving connections to the surrounding community and to provide a proper transition of intensities between the edges and center of the project. We eliminated the section of Ring Road that is parallel to Huntington and placed townhomes along that frontage. Oh, this not only engages Huntington, but also <laughs> offers a good transition of use between the existing single family on Huntington and the mixed use core of the proposed development. On the opposite side of the project, we looked at ways to encourage future interconnectivity. The first is to provide a curb cut at the intersection between the racetrack and academia properties. You can see that here. We did this so that in the future, a connection can potentially be made between those properties to Crane Drive and potentially beyond to Cleveland Road. Uh, as part of this too, we considered that that, inter that interconnection may very well go through racetrack's pond, and so we've considered 
additional <coughs> volume in our own pond to be able to handle that so that it would be a viable solution. North of this, we provided an additional connection point to allow for the future connection to the Meadowland property. So that's this intersection here. We did this so that if that property is ever redeveloped, they can have direct access to what very much looks like a public but is now private road. <coughs> We ran a TIA analysis on these improvements, including the traffic circles you see here, and the results of that say that all these traffic circles should function very well. To point out those traffic circles, we have the one here at Huntington that was a request in the staff report and in, in Planning Commission's comments. We also added one down here on Huntington and one at the entrance to the project as it exists today. As you can see, these roundabouts connect the project to a street grid network. This grid was determined by balancing what is to remain of the mall, including some of the parking that was required to remain for Belk, the topographical <laughs> challenges of the site, and also the implementation of the center green. The center green really is the heart of this project. Uh, it is what we see as one, on one, if not one of the most significant draws to the project. We envision this space to be activated with trees and landscaping to create a park-like environment. We are contemplating the use of synthetic turf so that the space is consistent throughout the seasons and more resistant to the impacts of constant use. We plan on including other amenity features such as a band shell that can be seen in the north of the property here. In general, we, need, we see the need for this, this space to be programmed for gathering and play. On the other end of the green, we are showing stormwater quality treatment areas these are the spaces, these, we see these spaces as opportunities to amenitize stormwater infrastructure. These will be designed for infiltration and will draw down after a rain event. In dry conditions, they will serve as an expansion to the green space. We see these as a good, a good example of this. Uh, if you look at Braselton, they have a center green as part of their city center. Then that, that green is a, a, a very good example of what we're seeing here. It's a lawn area that has underdrain and in dry conditions, it's used for um, gathering space in concerts and in wet weather, it, it uh, serves its purpose in that sense too. As you can see from the plan, we have placed a higher, higher intensities of uses around the center green and transitioned out to multifamily and then to single family townhomes. We have placed the transit station in the southwest corner of the site to facilitate both bus traffic into and out of the project. There are also three additional bus stops included. So here's the transit station. We have a bus stop here, one up here, and then one down this corner. We recognize that we should do all we can to depart from the existing auto-centric nature of the mall. We have tried to eliminate surface parking lots where possible, but it is difficult to do entirely. Case in point is Belk. They have the right to a refusal uh, granted in their lease agreement that gives them veto power over changes to the site. One of their requirements was to maintain the parking field and a certain number of spaces directly out in front of their store. So although that lot will need to stay. It will be upgraded to current ACC design standards, including limitations on the number of contiguous spaces and the inclusion of parking lot, street, or parking lot trees. To offset the loss of surface parking, we have uh, planned for parking decks in the multifamily development portions of the project. We have over, uh, overparked these so that they will not only serve the multifamily, but also can serve uh, patrons to both the retail and office portions. They're here and here on plan. Moving on to pedestrian circulation. Of course, to get away from cars, we have to have a robust pedestrian infrastructure. We worked with leisure services and other departments in the, in the design of this. Following their recommendations, we designed a 12-foot wide multi-use path in place of bike lanes. As you can see, this 12-foot wide multi-use path circles the site and makes connections from the project to the adjoining community. The total length of this path is just below a mile and a half, and that's just the orange multi-use section that does not count the blue, it's additional sidewalks and plaza spaces. Uh, where this, where this multi-use path crosses the roundabouts, it's difficult to see here, but in these areas, we're also providing RRFBs, those are the, the flashing beacons that we see in our pedestrian crossings around town. Uh, this is, of course, to improve safety in those, in those roundabout conditions. Moving over to stormwater. It was surprising to find there really is not much stormwater going on, stormwater management going on the site today. 
Um, the existing pond has uh, since lost the dam. So water pretty much freely, freely flows from the site today down into the creek. In 2018, a study was produced by Arcadis for ACC to look at the watershed management plan for the Middle Oconee River. One of the main solutions provided in that study was stormwater management on this site. As you can see from this plan, the last concept that was submitted had, significant, had significantly improved the existing condition, but we were able to improve upon this by an additional 6%. So you can see in the graphics, here's the existing condition where 11% is pervious. This was the plan that was uh, rejected by the Planning Commission. It had improved that quite a bit. Here's our plan today, so we're moving up to 37%, or an increase, 26% increase in pervious, pervious area. That, as Caitlin mentioned, is around 20 acres of removed pavement, uh, which is quite significant. I'd like to move to trees. Uh, we have a lot of trees shown in this plan. Um, there was a question from the MSR, from the MARC group about the number of trees that were going to be removed from the, from the site as it exists today. Uh, looking at that, we determined there's probably about 200 trees that would be taken down today. That's a, a collection of the parking lot trees that are really not performing well right now. Uh, also some trees that are along this Huntington section, which obviously have to be removed to engage that street. Um, and it does not necessarily take into account of trees planted in this, this pond. Uh, we are replacing those, those trees lost with over a thousand new trees. Um, pretty significant number, and that number does not include these areas for reforestation, which will have trees under two inch caliper, but planted in mass. So the number could well climb several hundred more than that. These are all the required trees that we're showing on our TMP. Does not necessarily mean it's all the trees that we're gonna be planting. Looking at phasing. Uh, here you have our phasing plan. We are proposing a two-part first phase. We're actually calling this a two-part first phase to indicate that what we're proposing is continuous construction, but with two parts. This is largely due to the necessity to keep the remaining portion of the mall operational throughout development. One portion of the site will remain secured for patrons while the other side is in redevelopment. You can see we're starting here with 1A. We have to keep an area open to be able to service the mall that will be remain in operation throughout all construction. Once that is complete and this site has been uh, buttoned up, we will then move to the remaining site, the section of 1B, which is you know, the remainder of the ring road and the pad for the transit station. It's, I wanted to note that the amount of construction that is occurring in this first phase, as you can see from the purple area, just in 1A, um, a large number of the units will be constructed. Nearly all of the road infrastructure, the green space, um, nearly half of the multifamily units, nearly half of the single family units, uh, of course, the assisted living as well. So it's a, it's a pretty large, significant portion of the project to be completed within that first phase. Uh, this concludes my presentation of the site. I'd like to now either, if there's questions, I can answer them now, or if not, I'd like to bring Mr. Neighbors up to the podium to talk a little bit about the... We'll have Mr. Neighbors come, and then if okay. there's questions for the development team, we'll, we'll respond to those after them. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Okay. Good evening. Mayor and council members, um, I am here likely because I live and breathe this. I usually represent the government side, and I am, by the way, Ken Neighbors. I'm a partner at McGuire Woods. I've been doing uh, catalytic economic development since 1997. I started with the vision of the city of Orlando to compete with Disney, which is not in the city of Orlando, to get tax revenue and to create an alternative downtown for Orlando. That was Universal Studios. So what we did for that TIF was brought an interchange off I-4 right into Universal Studios. And I think the facts speak for themselves. Highly competitive. They have their own downtown, plus they drive traffic and sales to the city of Orlando proper. All right, so Orlando had to make a strategic bet, right? They had to make a place, a destination venue. My travails have taken me to rural Georgia doing broadband, as well as things like the Atlanta Beltline. I was, I'm basically, the, I am the author of much of the pay-go practice in the city of Atlanta. Gulch was part of that. 
the four commercial corridors in the south side, which have been left behind, they're pay go. And so I am, I, I'm kind of here to help. You know, if you all want to get there, I'm here to be a second pin to what Dan is doing from our perspective, right? And I can tell you it's, it's a rare confluence of things when a community and, a, and, a, and leadership are ready and a developer is ready. And what do I mean by that? It took us 10 years to deliver a Publix grocery store to a TAD in Atlanta. The developers wouldn't come. They didn't want to take the risk, right? It took us two iterations to do the GM redevelopment, the assembly project in Doraville, and now it's on its third, right? It's all, you gotta have the money, the market, and the people together at the same time. I submit to you that you might have that now. All right, so, but back to really the formal program, compliance with your priorities in your mall redevelopment plan, right? The four pillars, public infrastructure, housing opportunities, economic development partnership opportunities, youth development. I'm gonna take those in turn, I'm gonna try to move fast. I'm a Midwestern Southerner that was raised in New Jersey part of the time, so I, I move fast and I don't keep up with my clicker. I got <laughs> She's the best. <laughs> so, so, and I really am trying to speed up to give more Q&A. So public infrastructure, what are we doing? Best in class. Redeveloping a, a deteriorating mall. If you look around the country, mall is the old way. The new way is like Pond City Market, you know, which is old Sears Catalog Center, which is now destination driving off of a trail, the Beltline, right? That's where we're going. And so that's what, they, that, that's what they're trying to do. Bike and pedestrian infrastructure, that 16-foot multi-use path. Central public green space, a la Avalon, if you ever go to Colony Square, which was an original hotel, commercial, retail, office development, right? The people that actually brought you Camp Creek Marketplace and that brought you part of Atlantic Station brought you Colony Square, right? And they're central green. It's iced in the winter for skating. It's movie theaters, it's all those active space things that actually keep people there and out of traffic when traffic is too heavy. It allows you to just stay in place, right? Intersection improvements, the raised, the raised crosswalks, reducing pedestrian vehicular conflict risk. And then the big thing, this is like we tried to, this is actually what we did um, for Turner Field. The parking, you gotta get, surface parking lot is blight, right? And so you're, you're actually increasing the pervious surfaces you're getting rid of this, you're, get, you're know, moving to uh, stack decks, structured parking, that's very expensive, right? And you're also putting that stormwater system in place, right? The, the, the circles, in New Jersey, you couldn't get your driver's license unless you went through Somerville Circle. I did that at 17, so I get it. And it is actually very helpful, all right? Increased housing opportunities. I will say this, the policy is 20%, at 80% of AMI for 20 years. Because of the intensity of the upfront costs and the impact on the financeability really out their pocket, what we're saying is, can we do 10% across every door? There is no poor unit, there is no poor door across the, all the multifamily, but we'll do it for 40 years. We started with 30, we heard the community and we said, let's do this for 40 years, <clears throat> right? That is really moving toward the curve of permanent affordability. When you start putting, pushing out 40 and 50 years, at least at my age, right? That's, that's getting close to permanent. Um, economic development, I'd be remiss if I didn't say 70,000 square feet of loft office space, right? Repurposed, created, responsive to co-location opportunities, great opportunity for, for women, small minority businesses to participate in the upside, right? We call that now commercial affordability. It leads to the ability to drive commercial affordability as part of what's going on. It's responsive to post-COVID uh, office development. And I, you know, I, it will be a driver. Uh, the last quick point, and this is something of discussion, the Youth Development Center, the hard cost, I believe, was 3.6 million for that 6,100 square feet, right? It's a nominal rent being charged for legal reasons, $100 a, a year. So it's as close to free as you can get it under the law. Right, the related incentive is less than half of the full construction value, the build out cost, the capital cost, right? I think as a, a after a, a liner note for all of us old album people, the liner note is that 
the developers or the affiliates of the developers have been providing operational support. So I, 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 there was some confusion. Some of that may have been ours, but I think I want to put that on the table, right? What are the ongoing benefits to students? Mentorship, career development, job training. They have technology all in there, and that's the way of the future. And I, I am not flying, uh, I am not moving the slides, because I told you that's what I don't do. Um, but I'm going to move my slides now. So you can all, I think you have this presentation. You have this in your packet for sure. Conservative case scenario, we pointed to 5.2 million a year, growing at 2%. I think your, your historical growth rate in values has been 3.6%. The numbers guys can check me on that, right? And the high side, or your, your projection was 7.685 million, rather than a 2%. And you can see the end value in really small, 191 on the left conservative case, and then 280.779 million in the other case. And so, you know, visually that's what it looks like, right? That's the compounding value of the growth as realized in increment, as and to the extent the developer does what they say they're gonna do. Here's the other scenario shows you how you get up to 250 million, right, in, you know, in that, in that year 29 range. So if we're in at capped at 189, subject to a further cap of 29%, right, under either scenarios, you, you, you have the prospect of getting there. A quick word about why PAYGO is different and what the benefit of, of a TAD is, right? Right now, if, if the, the value of the mall is X before developed, it's in the blue. All the tax, if it's $10, every, every millage rate, every, every mill goes into your general fund. ACC schools, right? right? We created the TAD. Bravo, right? The developer only gets the hash. So, right? so if we go out 30 years, you know, we haven't taken anything, but we've created the platform, right? the palette for you getting the hash mark. And you, in this case, because we decided that if we wanted to de-risk it, as I said, instead of you issuing a bond or, or series of bonds in phases, the developer said, okay, we hear you, we'll, we'll self-finance using the PAYGO structure, and there's a, both the bond owned by the developer and PAYGO and Gulch, but here we're just gonna do PAYGO, that's the hash. So as to the extent they do what they say they're gonna do according to the PD, they get the hash as a reimbursement, which your, your folks are gonna verify, right? That's why we say de-risking it, right? And by the way, there's gonna be schedules and other deliverables that have to happen, right? And so you can manage the downside, but have the benefit of all the upside. And that's what I like to hear. It's a win-win. What is the halo effect? My team challenged me, well, you all keep talking about this. Well, what does that mean? <clears throat> so the halo effect is the adjacent areas during the 30 years that grow in value, driven by you putting a destination in place. That's that top. If I had that pointer thing, the sky can use. <laughs> right, that's, that's right there. That's right there. That's the halo effect in year one through 30. I, I, they didn't put me on tech. I used to do that. All right, and so, but, but after 30, right? After 30, you get, you get this and that. So what is this and that? Camp Creek Marketplace. Never had been a development for retail and shopping in Southwest Atlanta since 1967 which was Greenbrier Mall, which is still dead, right? Remember I said, be careful of dying malls, right? We put Camp Creek Marketplace down there powered by a TAD, <coughs> right? After they did that and got committed and everybody was comfortable, guess what? They put an extension across the street, right? The property across the street, Princeton Lakes, which they did in a TAD in a different city, but that's another story. One million dollars in assessed value turned into 136 million dollars in assessed value by 2018, right? So that is that is right there, and you know during your build out over here, what is that? Camp Creek Marketplace. They did a business center expansion in the very last year of the TAD, and we pulled the records, and I think we came up with it was it, it that project delivered 60.64.5 million of fair market value. 25.8 million of fair market value in the very last year of the Camp Creek Marketplace TAD. I was buying counsel on Camp Creek Marketplace, right? And I represented the school board on Princeton Lakes in a different city. That's how long I've been doing this. And I, I, it's, I'm feeling like I'm aging in place, hopefully gracefully. But with that, I will say, I, I think I can move to a couple more slides very quickly. You don't need to hear all that, right? 
just to give you comfort. It's in the statute. Redevelopment Powers Law 364419 says you can enter into agreements with private entities for up to 30 years, <coughs> right? Typically, you know, we do bond transactions for, for very complex infrastructure, go out 30 years. But, but I, I want you to understand, as a proxy for you financing, the developer is financing. A lot of it, a lot more equity, what, the way we're doing that, equity is very expensive. We get that. So they, they are incentivized to get there fast, right? On the school board side, because we did not interpose a bond like the Golds did, right, that meant that we <coughs> did not meet the squares of the IGA you have with the school board. Because basically, if you did a bond deal, they were in for the horizon, right, for the full term of the repayment. But because we don't have, we have another obligation that's not necessarily issued by you, it's incurred but not issued, that needs to be cleaned up to keep the school board in there, right? I would submit that that's integral to the community getting what they want. And so, and there's a lot of things in here that we think make this the right thing. But, but the developer took the, the sale of bonds off the table to, to address the risk concerns, right? And to address where the project is right now. Um, and so, you know, even though it's PAYGO, it's the same thing that pays it. Remember that hash? That's the only thing that pays the developer back. There's no, no general funds. There's no money that's going into your general fund currently. There's no other pledges. There's no sales tax, which will be generated by the retail. This is really just the increase in the assessed value. With that, I, will, I hope I was brief enough. I didn't get kicked yet. And so I will, I will now sit down with the rest of the team and we'll take any questions that you might have. Thank you for indulging. Questions for the development team from the body. Uh, Commissioner Myers. Yeah, I, I had I had one very specific thing on the mall redevelopment, and I just on the something you brought up at the beginning about the um, artificial turf use. And I know that uh, I was involved in something else a couple of years ago with the artiste, our SPLOST, and there was a lot of discussion from members of that group about the use of artificial uh, turf and its uh, effects on users and such. And I just wondered if you had any update on that, if the technology has changed or... Is this uh, in reference to some of the cases of people saying there was cancer that came from artificial I, turf? I can't even remember that, it, that and I, I couldn't media do a full a search time. here. Hmm? That was in the media for a long time, and I don't think that was ever proven to necessarily be accurate. Uh, it had to deal with uh, soccer goalies, I think, mm -hmm. and the use of uh, potentially a rubber chip in, in turf. Um, that's really a sports field application. My son plays soccer, has for several years. He plays on artificial turf, mm -hmm. as do a lot of club teams. Uh, it's not a concern to me. Okay. Um, it, it's never really been founded that that was necessarily statistically accurate. Be that as it may, uh, in this application would likely be sand that's used as the filler on top of the artificial turf and not rubber chip. So I think that those fears are, are, are basically not founded, just mm -hmm. based on the data that I'm aware of in the industry. Um, can, can someone tell me what the length of the project will be from beginning of construction to end of construction? We anticipate it'll take five years to complete from start to finish for all phases, all development. Okay, so looking at that chart of the TAD money coming in, the cumulative, in five years, I mean, so, so you guys are putting all this money up front, and in five years you'll have collected, according to that chart, like $24 million. So you're sort of... That, again, is where you're, you're putting in the upfront money. Yes, ma'am. Okay. The first phase of the project, just super round numbers, has got about $90 million in horizontal mm -hmm. infrastructure that we'll have to um, finance in some manner. I mean, <clears throat> at the end of the day, the way the process will work on our side is once this is approved and we have this agreed-upon mm -hmm. amount that will be paid for the increment, mm -hmm. Uh, we will work with financiers across multiple mm -hmm. platforms to put together the capital to build the project. That will be money out of the developer's pocket. It could be private equity. It could be public equity. It could be mezzanine mm -hmm. financing. There's any number of ways to finance the project. Um, and then once a structure is built, a lot of times it gets recapitalized, and they will 
you know, put it into another marketplace with better financing terms, lower interest rates, longer terms. So yes, in short, we're funding 100%, and the 90 million was just the horizontal infrastructure. The first mm -hmm. phase of the vertical infrastructure that again, remember, has to be built before we get any mm -hmm. benefit to get to that $24 million number you suggested there that's on the chart is about 200 million. So 290 million, I mean, if you wanted to do simple math, mm -hmm. it's probably 40% equity that has to be put in, 60% would be mm -hmm. financed, something like that out of the gate. And, and the other thing is the halo effect that was referred to yes. in the chart. Was that halo? I'm, I'm assuming the halo would, doesn't follow street lines, no. um, but the, the financial numbers you were giving were for the, tad, the outside of the mall development Tad or the fuller area, just I can, geographic. I think I can shed some light on that. When we talk about the halo effect, we talk about it at the fullest extent, okay. to be practical. If you want to talk about it a very close extent, uh, where we're connecting a neighborhood with a sidewalk as a part of this Tad, where it's now going to be a walkable neighborhood to get in here, mm -hmm. my assessment is, is that property value is probably going to increase. It's going to be a more desirable home to live in, just like what we see when you build. <coughs> we talk about building trails and greenways mm -hmm. and things like that. That house sells for a little more money. The next house sells for a little more money. The tax assessor revalues the neighborhood based on sales comps. All of a sudden, you get a halo effect for that neighborhood. But that happens, and if you think about this particular case, just look right across the street. You got the, the old pink building that's over there that's been there since well before I was in school here. I mean, if you don't think that that place is going to redevelop once we get this done, and their tax valuation mm -hmm. is going to go up. So the halo effect to us is, in this case, and I think Dan <coughs> mentioned it in his presentation, you know, we're only taking TAD dollars off our tax parcels. That's it. So everything from adjacent to that to probably really, you know, all the way out to Caterpillar to the mm -hmm. west and, you know, even back in past um, mm -hmm. uh, Timothy and all that, you know, you're going to see this redevelopment mm -hmm. uh, of, of new housing, additional housing, redevelopment of commercial. That's, that's when we say the halo effect, it's all of that cumulatively that you will get the full benefit of. Mike? Sure. Thank you, Mayor. And just to piggyback on that, John, uh, certainly um, I know Dan mentioned the word transformational. We've used that a lot here as well. But, I, I, you know, I could see the halo effect going going out to past Sam's where we, you know, there's a, a big development out there that we approved years ago, if you remember, Mayor, that still hasn't happened yet. So, I mean, there's there's possibilities there that open the door for us to, 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 to help help this community uh, with its finances and and the school board as well and, and meeting the needs that they need to meet so that that halo effect is very important uh, for, a, for how we how, how how we're thinking about this and a big part of that too is the community's desire I mean you got award-winning transit and, and transportation program and here we're going to put uh, you know one of the major bus stops and transit facilities that's going to allow the jump all the way from downtown out to here via that um, which ultimately leads to people being out in that neighborhood, being able to take transit. And so, I mean, and, and just as a reminder, if it wasn't clear, the, the, the cost to construct the transit station is in the $189 million that we're asking for that will be utilized by the local government to be able to build the station, um, you know, at, at such time they're ready. Jesse. Yeah, you did this a little bit at the MARC meeting, but could you just share the you, you met with many different departments, just like briefly, which which departments you met with and what, how that got incorporated into this plan. Well, we've been pretty much driving this, my, my friend Brad over here crazy for the last uh, six months and, and his staff uh, to start with, but I know we've met with uh, the, the, the Parks and Recreation Department, we've met with Traffic and Transportation, we've met with Public Works, uh, we've met with Public Utilities. Um, you know, there's some very interesting things that have transpired throughout the course of this project. An example of something that came out of our meeting is that, you know, all the roads in here are public use roads. All the transportation improvements are public transportation improvements that will be accessible to the public. But we're going to own and maintain all those. So even if you think about not getting the TAD dollars off of this particular mall, I mean, the maintenance cost for all the infrastructure in there is on us. But uh, one of the requests by the Public Works Department and by the Planning Department was is that the road on the very west side of this plan, the left plan left, 
um, which is now private and will be private until and unless you guys ask for it to be public. Now, why would you ask for it to be public? It's because when the racetrack and the developments behind the racetrack <coughs> redevelop because of the halo effect, you want that to be a public road so that they have frontage on a public road so that they follow your UDC and comprehensive land use plan. So that's just one example. The, the, the uh, multi-use paths are another example. We were planning on putting bike lanes in the development and regular sidewalks. And after the meeting that, that Scott had with the um, Parks and Rec Department, uh, they requested that we look at doing multi-use paths to get the bikes completely out of the travel lanes and put them on a multi-use path. Again, it's part of our TAD ask. You know, this plan was developed to be what the comprehensive land use plan, the UDC, and we felt the desire of the communities were, and there's a cost associated with that, and the cost associated with that is $189 million over the course of a 30-year period of time. And so the alignment of those transit bus stops was in the, the transit, yeah, with we the met, transit department. The pedestrian safety improvements are in consultation with yep. our experts on yep. pedestrian safety improvements, sure reduced are. traffic fatalities, et cetera. In fact, uh, we met with the uh, SPLOS committee, uh, not the SPLOS committee, I'm sorry, the SPLOS office to be able to get their cost estimate for the, the transit station and a preliminary plan that they had for a transit <coughs> station to make sure that it met with their needs and, and, and utilize their plan. For hundreds of hours that were spent probably in meetings and plans revisions at requests. Will stops and this is probably for transit but will the um stops expand past the mall i mean it's probably for transit huh you talking about the uh the the bus the, stops. The, the, the bus stops will they expand past the mall mm -hmm. my understanding and then again this came out of a meeting with transit is is that this is one of two stations that need to be constructed to get all the way back to downtown and that this is the last station that enables them to get all the way out to the county line going west that this station will allow them so yeah th there will be bus stops there won't necessarily be another transit station but from what i understood them to say that this was one of the key pieces that will enable them to continue out uh, to get out to the Caterpillar area and, and, and actually to the development that Mike was speaking about mm -hmm. um, that's across from Sam's there. Thank you. Sure. The, and I'll, I'll also defer to our uh, transit development plan that's under development now that we're asking the survey response and for people to get involved. And that's going to help us understand what those needs are out there. But clearly you've heard those needs for some time. Uh, John's correct. In order to make this work, there is one in between. Uh, and that uh, project uh, is in the um, property act, um, site selection phase right now. So this will sort of, I, I don't think there's enough money that we currently have in the SPLOS project to do both projects. So this is helpful to accomplish that vision. And if I may, you know, everybody's aware, certainly in the transit department especially, that there is just a total, you know, lack of service on the west side. And so this transfer station is not just to serve within this development and to head toward downtown, but also to be able to extend service to the rest of the west side. Right. Yeah. So, sort of a launch pad. Yeah. Other questions for the development team? Mayor. Yes. I just want to make a statement. Um, Mike has mentioned it, uh, Commissioner Hamby. I mean, we have an opportunity to really transform that mall and I just you know and I know it's a lot um, I mean talking about a lot of money millions of dollars but we have an opportunity to really change what's going on out there on that on that west side and by the mall and uh, it would behoove us if, you know wherever how this thing go that it, if it falls through I mean it, it's just we just really need to make sure that this project happens I, I can't see it's not, and it just sort of brings back the memory when we was trying to do Walmart downtown with Landmark is now, and we let that opportunity slide through. It was, that was an economic development, that was job opportunity, and we let that slide through. If we don't move forward with this project, and again, I, I can't speak for the school board and what they're going to do, or for the um, 
um, the other groups, but um, as a commission, though, we have a great opportunity to really bring something to light in this community and bring a great opportunity um, for this community. So I just want to make this statement. Thanks, Commissioner. I appreciate that. Um, I, I do want to, for the body, make a couple of observations that I brought to the uh, mall, mall Area Redevelopment Committee yesterday that I just want to, to be in the air for everybody here. Um, and, and the first of those really relates to the nature of malls in the United States. I mean, as, as much as I have these uh, glowing memories of uh, seeing Rocky II at the Military Circle Mall in Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, getting the Orange Julius there, and working at the record bar, record store in that mall, you know, the nature of malls is that they've been on this long and, and you know, dramatic decline. Um, and what you see in communities is sort of a series of options. There is what I described yesterday as the lipstick on the pig option, where you essentially leave the parking lot, you leave the structure, but you see some very devalued low-scale use, like warehousing or the like. Um, you see what I think was described earlier as sort of the, the Lego set approach, where you basically leave everything, but you put a few new amenities, maybe an apartment building on the site, but you don't do anything else. And, and there is instead what we have really encouraged, and, and, and I will be uh, forthright in being chief among those who said that the, the Lego approach did not meet community values and did not meet community needs. Um, and instead, what we asked for is something that had great aesthetic benefit, had environmental quality that was very high, and, and, and had a high functional benefit, including some of the housing stock we so desperately need, including that targeted at people below area median income. So I'm glad we've got that as a plan in front of us. And of course, we, we had conversation at our agenda setting meeting just a couple of weeks ago uh, about the plan development. Um, and uh, among the things that I've observed about these kind of projects is that to get them <coughs> off the ground, there are simply redevelopment costs um, that in the context of a 75 acre, 75 acre piece of property that's almost completely covered by asphalt uh, are significant. And uh, of course, some of what we have to consider are not only those costs, but, but the market we're in. Um, you know, if you were facing 75 acres of asphalt in Athens, Georgia, or in Midtown Atlanta, and you were wanting to do something transformational like this, you'd have those same costs. You'd have the stormwater facilities, you'd have the walking paths, you know, you'd have the affordable housing component. Um, of course, the reality of the Athens market is that rents aren't as high as they are in Midtown Atlanta, and, and we can't get the total volume of development on this site just due to market conditions. And, and so that disparity between the absolute hard redevelopment costs and the perspective rent and the perspective amount of commercial and residential space is in some reason why we're being asked to move beyond what I will call the benchmark 15% uh, to something more like 29%, which I think is a rational request. And, and, and so I completely understand that. Um, you know, unlike in Midtown, we're not gonna go 40 stories high here. Um, you know, we're not gonna get tens of thousands of units. We're gonna be getting 1,000 units. But that's going to be very meaningful for Athens, um, and I think not only what we always used to call the Pink Mall, um, but but a lot of those low-slung buildings that were <coughs> built in 1960 and 1970 along Atlanta Highway are going to be part of that halo effect. So if you think about the tool rental place where I've rented many a floor sander, um, the, uh, the, the place where I, I used to buy my uh, dishes when I could buy dishes right across the street from the mall, I, I anticipate probably all that to redevelop to the general benefit of the community. And so that's going to, of course, create new revenue well outside of the TAD that's going to go to both the unified government's general fund and to the school district's general fund. And last note I want to make uh, concerns our partnership with the school district. I mean, as you all know, that was my bread and butter for 20 years, and I, I care very dearly about the um, fiscal success uh, and the functional su success of the school system and a point that uh, is important to make is to think a little bit about the context of our whole tax digest, because this is 75 acres of, you know, many tens of thousands of acres in the community. Um, and, and we sometimes are challenged, of course, by the nature of having a high student proportion of the population. Um, but a fiscal benefit both to us and the school district is when you put a lot of young people in the standard uh, around the corner or the mark 
uh, or, or the projects that are under development on West Broad Street right now, uh, what you have is a, a building project that delivers lots of funds to the unified government without a great deal of cost because, of course, you've got just a short frontage of roadway, um, you've got one sewer line in, you've got one water line in, uh, and for the school district, similarly, they see this great lift in, uh, in revenue with no K-12 students in those projects. And so um, while this specific project would produce some cost to the school district in the near term, when you look at the overall digest, this community is producing so much new construction that, that doesn't bear any cost for the district in terms of their mission space. So, you know, I would ask us and our partners to kind of consider that overall environment as, as we're looking at this. So, Commissioner Thornton. Quick question. Um, we keep talking about the halo effect, and and uh, that just sounds great. But is there um, opportunities for, we, we talked about the pink mall, um, is there, is there, if they ever want to go to re redevelopment, do they have an option of a TAD or do they just benefit from the halo? So effect? after this meeting, what I'll do is just shoot everybody the link on our website to this tax allocation district geography, um, which includes <coughs> many parcels that are adjacent. So this project doesn't consume the entire tax allocation district. There are many other parcels that at some later point yeah. could see redevelopment. And then, of course, there's a lot of property beyond the TAD, but that's in that general west side. So I, I anticipate we're probably going to see some redevelopment both within the TAD that's not part of this plan and outside of it. Mayor Gertz, I just want to point, I don't know exactly which map you're pointing to, but the one that is on, like, our website is currently broken at the moment joseph um is is working on fixing that so i don't know which one you're going to send but i just wanted to make that <laughs> note Th thanks for that I, I think i have it in a pdf too okay. so i can send the pdf over so, <laughs> okay uh, i've got that on my laptop so uh, jesse yeah yeah i just wanted to give a few kind of concluding remarks since this is in uh my district <laughs> um you know, I, I really appreciate what you said, Mayor, Commissioners Hamby and, and Fisher. Uh, I really appreciate what you all said. Um, and I really appreciate the time we got with, with Dan on the phone. Um, you know, those uh, finer details that we need to solidify, I think, are important. Um, but I'm encouraged that we're going to get there. Um, one of my uh, favorite things of all the presentation tonight was the timeline that the development team shared. Um, I think it feels a lot like we're cramming a lot in right now in a, in a rushed fashion. And we are, I mean, we're, we're trying to hammer out a lot of details, um, but they've been at this for years, plural. And one of the things that's really encouraged me uh, about this process is that the development team, the, all three of whom are here uh, tonight, um, got pretty harshly critiqued by the Planning Commission and a lot in the community at the first town hall we had. Um, and they didn't try to move forward with something, you know, barely modified and then, uh, you know, try to try to push that through. They completely redesigned how they were going about it. They brought in a whole new team of people to work with. They changed the approach. They, they came at the design and part of that was enabled by our TAD process. You know, I wanted to be in earnest say before and I'll say again, you know, I need to eat my words about my suspicion of TADs because that really is a, a big part of what's made this possible, I think. But the engagement with our staff to thoughtfully incorporate transit and TPW provisions and leisure services policies into how they design this, I think is, <coughs> is, is really huge. Um, and, you know, they've already brought in youth force into the existing mall, but that's currently an empty building, you know, half empty building. Um, and, and this is an opportunity for a youth programming like that to be in an actually activated space that people want to be in. Um, so, you know, all that to say, I, I do hope that, you know, pending the, the details getting worked out with Dan and what we see come through in the CBA, but I'm, I'm optimistic about where that's going to go. Um, this really is a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. And the impact here is not only going to transform this part of District 6 in the west side, but I mean, when we talk about alleviating pressures on our housing market, the, the quantity of housing that's being built here as well as the quantity of affordable units that are a part of that is going to have a tremendous impact countywide on the cost of rental housing in this community. Um, when we talk about what's going on with, with traffic, I mean, yeah, there's going to be more people living here. There's going to be 
activated instead of empty commercial space, so people will want to go there. People will also be able to walk and bike there. People will be able to walk out their door to a grocery store that's housed in this in this development. So, um, you know, the the fear of even I think the impact on traffic I think is is maybe outsized. I think what we're actually going to see is something much better and healthier. Um, so, you know, I just encourage uh, everyone here to, um, you know, sit with. Uh, all of what everyone has said tonight and, and, and try to balance that with what is truly like an overwhelming number of factors to consider in a condensed timeline. And yeah, thanks. Thanks, I appreciate it, Commissioner. All right. All right, motion to adjourn from I Commissioner second. Hamby. I second it. Second from Commissioner Thornton, all in favor? Aye. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you so much for your time.